February is American Heart Month, a time when all people, especially women, are encouraged to focus on their cardiovascular health. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the U.S. Yet, research shows that nearly half of the American women do not realize this. Heart-related illnesses and death are avoidable, and this week's episode seeks to raise awareness of heart-healthy practices everyone should take. Although originally recorded last October, it is fitting to save this unusually long interview for American Heart Month. We are devoting two full episodes to this topic because the information here is simply too important to edit down. Without further ado, here is part one of this special two-part episode of Now That's Good Chemistry, a podcast devoted to exploring chemicals in our lives. I'm your host, Susan Savage. We are broadcasting from our studio on the campus of Indian Hill High School, located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Joining me today is the podcast editor, Tom Millard, and Dr. James Kong, a cardiologist at the Christ Hospital. Welcome, gentlemen. Dr. Kong, can you share with us your credentials and expertise? Uh, Well, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast, as you know, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, As you mentioned, I'm a cardiologist that's a heart specialist, and I have a subspecialty in interventional cardiology, which is where I offer minimally invasive treatments for people who have coronary disease and other heart conditions and vascular conditions, Uh, and that's my specialty. And I uh, practice at the Christ Hospital and see a variety of general cardiology conditions and atherosclerosis, which is what we're going to talk about today. Atherosclerosis is a disease of blood vessels. And it's uh, one of the uh, most common cardiovascular conditions and uh, is, uh, in fact, the number one killer um, um, in, um, in the U.S. Uh, today. It, there's always a competition between uh, heart disease and uh, cancer, you know, lately, but um, heart disease is still right up there. And atherosclerosis uh, predominantly involves the deposition of plaque in blood vessels. So these blood vessels have plaque, which is an accumulation of a complex substance in the wall of the blood vessel. And it can cause all kinds of problems for the blood vessel, but the thing that people are most familiar with is if this plaque grows into the pathway where the blood flows, it can cause an obstruction or blockage. It can happen slowly over time, or it can happen suddenly, and that could lead to a heart attack if it happens in the heart. So what is the chemical makeup of the plaque? And what is the chemical makeup of the medications and foods that help reduce or prevent the buildup of plaque? Plaque is a complex substance that uh, I like to say has a lot of junk in it. So a lot of what you might, uh, our listeners might be aware of, is cholesterol. So cholesterol is a big part of it, but there's also inflammation. And so those aren't chemicals, but they're actors that make some of the chemicals that are in plaque. And those are inflammatory cells or cells of the immune system that have been recruited into the plaque and they become activated in the plaque. And it's that activation that leads to inflammation. So these cells make chemicals and there's different kinds that um, you might think about. There are cell receptors, There are cell ligands which activate the receptors and they cause these cells to elaborate these other chemicals. They are called cytokines, chemokines are another kind. And basically what they do is they act as attractants to these other cells that bring them into the plaque. And when the cells get there, these chemicals may cause them to do things. They might transform into other cell types. They might make enzymes that perpetuate the inflammation inside the plaque. So those are some of the chemicals in the cells. Some other things that you might find in the plaque is calcification, uh, which is the buildup of calcium, and it makes the plaques very hard and difficult to work with if you're going to treat them, say, for example, with surgery or with angioplasty. And there are also uh, connective tissues, uh, uh, molecules in the plaque Collagen is an example, and that's a, uh, an organic polymer that 
forms the structure uh, inside the plaque. You asked about uh, the chemicals that we might use to, um, to treat the plaque and also chemicals that might sort of promote the, promote the formation of plaque. The, those might fall under diet, for example. Those are the most common sort of chemicals that we might encounter. And the truth is that we're not 100% sure about all the chemicals that might promote or um, inhibit plaque formation. But what we have recognized is that ultra-processed foods, which tend to be high in simple sugars, particularly fructose, tend to make plaque worse. Also, LDL, which is a kind of subspecies of uh, cholesterol, low-density lipoprotein, and the cholesterol itself is a complex molecule that we could talk about. But it's this particular type of cholesterol called LDL, which seems to also promote plaque formation. You might see high LDL levels in people because of genetics or because of unhealthy lifestyles, such as lack of exercise, poor diet, smoking is a big one. The chemicals that we would use to treat a plaque or for people with plaque uh, to reduce the amount of plaque and also to prevent the complications within plaque, like heart attack, as we were talking about a moment ago, are predominantly medications. One of them, and probably one of the most important ones that's revolutionized the uh, treatment of plaque, are statin medications. And their scientific name is HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors because <laughs> okay. they inhibit this uh, enzyme called hydroxymethylglutarol coa a enzyme. That's a mouthful. With a mouthful, and it, uh, that's why we just re reduce it down to letters. That enzyme is responsible for the rate limiting step in the synthesis of cholesterol in the, uh, in the liver, which is actually where cholesterol comes from. So we're slowing down how fast the reaction can occur. Exactly. But, okay. Exactly. And in response to that, the liver will then try to pick up cholesterol from the bloodstream through receptors, which we talked about a moment ago, um, and reduce the cholesterol in the bloodstream that way. So that's how those medications work. And they frankly have revolutionized um, cardiovascular care since they came out. And then some common examples are atorvastatin or rosuvastatin. The other chemical that is very important in uh, treating atherosclerosis is acetosalicylic acid which everybody knows by the name aspirin. Yes. So aspirin um, is often thought of as a pain reliever, which it is, but it also has some special properties to prevent blood clots. Yep. Blood clots are the kinds of things that can get into plaques and cause heart attacks and strokes if, that, uh, if you have atherosclerosis in other territories, such as the brain. And so acetosalicylic acid works by inhibiting the uh, enzyme cyclooxygenase, which is responsible for the production of thromboxane A2, and all of this leads to uh, activation of platelets, which is part of the uh, event that leads to activation of um, the clotting cascade and blood clots. So aspirin prevents that. So in layman's terms, aspirin thins the blood. You could say that, yeah. Yep. I know yep. it's anticoagulating, yes. but it yes. is. Thin, That's right. In layman's turn, it thins the blood. Can you clarify for me? I've always been confused about LDLs and HDLs. What, what, I've been told some of that is good and some of it is bad. And when you get your right. cholesterol taken, mm -hmm. you're given a value for both. When, when should we be concerned? So uh, cholesterol is, by itself, is a, it's a waxy substance, it's a molecule that is part of normal biology. And our bodies make it, it's made in the liver as we were just talking about. And your body uses it to build cells to, as a foundation or building block for hormones and for digestion and other processes. And it moves around inside your body in, uh, packaged in particles that are wrapped in proteins. And those proteins are called lipoproteins and they have uh, different properties, and when certain of these lipoproteins are combined with cholesterol, we call them HDL, LDL, and then there are other examples as well. And they're predominantly based on size uh, and density of the particles. 
So HDL stands for high density, density. lipoprotein, LDL is low density lipoprotein. You can further break down the characteristics of LDL, for example, if you break them further down into their particle number, particle size. Um, I imagine there's some um, spectroscopy or something like that that's used to separate those, and you can figure out which ones are the bad ones and which ones are, are not so bad. But what it comes down to is that these LDL particles are the ones that have been associated with atherosclerosis. So if you have a lot of LDL, if your LDL is high, not just the total cholesterol, but specifically if the LDL is high, that's when you may be at risk. We used to think that HDL, the opposite, is actually protective. There was an observation that people who have a high HDL level seem to have less atherosclerosis. There's some change in thinking recently that it might have less to do with HDL and that HDL is actually higher in people who have other uh, ratios of cholesterol that look better. So if you have a high HDL, I think you can still feel pretty good about it. Right now though, LDL, there's a lot of focus on that one because that's the one for which we have a treatment. Right. So, so if your HDLs are high, we're okay. But if your LDLs are high, it's not good. Or is it a combination of your total cholesterol that you should be concerned about? It's, uh, it's both, actually, although LDL is probably the worst. And um, I remind patients about what their goal is by saying that LDL is the lousy one and you want it to be low. L for so if it's high, you want it to be low. And a high HDL is probably good. A low HDL is probably bad. We don't have treatments for those things. So it's not that we ignore them, but we tend to focus on the LDL on day-to-day -day practice because those statin medications that I mentioned, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, are very good at not only lowering the LDL, but preventing heart attack and stroke. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, can you give us a sense of the scale of how thick plaque is before it starts to pose a health risk? Plaque actually begins as just, what's it's called a fatty streak. It's probably very small and has maybe no thickness in a blood vessel, maybe as early as our 20s. So previous studies have shown in autopsies that um, people in their 20s may have this very early beginnings of plaque. And so it's there, it's flat, it's in the wall. The um, blood vessels themselves that we're talking about, particularly in the heart, are anywhere from two to four millimeters. Um, in diameter, um, and um, the wall is um, the wall of the artery is also you know sort of proportional to that. It's only several microns um, thick, and then the plaque builds up in the wall, and the wall has layers. As the plaque expands, it can actually occupy the entire blood vessel. So we're talking about growing from you know just a few microns to occupying the entire blood vessel, you know, several millimeters. That's not something that generally takes or that happens right away. It can. It takes a lifetime, so it starts. It can start in our 20s, and then maybe manifest itself or come to detection or attention decades later. So it takes a long time for that to happen. The one exception is when you have an inflamed plaque. So an inflamed plaque, or what we used to call a vulnerable plaque, is one that might suddenly become active, or what I like to say, it gets hot. So the surface of that plaque may erode or it may frankly rupture. And when that happens, the contents of the, um, the, contents of the plaque, in particular a molecule called tissue factor, when it's exposed to blood, it activates clotting proteins in the blood. And that can cause a clot to form on top of the plaque. So if that plaque is very low profile, it's only a millimeter in thickness, it may not cause an obstruction in the blood vessel. But if it gets a blood clot on top of it, that blood clot can, within minutes, totally occlude the artery, and then you have a heart attack. So the plaque will catch the blood to cause the blood clot, or there's already a blood clot that's formed, and that it gets caught by the plaque? It's a great question. Um, one of the things about um, uh, one of the principles of uh, biology, and I'm sure you can also describe this in chemical reactions where there's a balance is that there's a homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So our bodies are constantly making blood clots and breaking them down. Our body has systems 
to very quickly generate a blood clot and then very quickly dissolve it. So those cells or platelets and the proteins that participate in making a blood clot are floating around in our blood all the time okay. in an inactive state. But if they're stimulated, such as a plaque eroding or rupturing, and then you get the exposure of these contents to the blood, that's a stimulus to activate these cells and proteins to make a blood clot. I just told you that if you get a blood clot in a small space, like a blood vessel, you're gonna have a heart attack, which is true. But if you, if you cut yourself, then you'll want to stop bleeding. So if you have a cut on your skin, you make a blood clot to stop that. And so there are minor injuries, bumps and bruises and things that we might encounter on every day that we're not aware of and our body just takes care of them because these systems are working automatically. Um, I usually tell my patients that um, plaque is never normal, but it is more common as people get older. And so statistically, you may be more likely to see it as people get older, but it is not necessarily a normal process of aging. Hmm. And there are risk factors or conditions that might predispose a person to develop atherosclerosis. And we mentioned some of them earlier, like a sedentary lifestyle, poor diet and smoking. Other conditions that might lead to this include high blood pressure or hypertension, high cholesterol, which we were just talking about, uh, as well as diabetes, which is, um, it's a blood sugar disorder, you know, predominantly, but there are some other inflammatory things that happen with diabetes. Is there a hereditary component to? Absolutely. It's probable that there are some genes related to, let's say, cholesterol metabolism that predispose to atherosclerosis. Either you have a defect in how much cholesterol you make or how you clear it. There may be genes that affect blood pressure. There may be genes that affect cellular repair mechanisms. All of these things that might contribute to it. Uh, when you see atherosclerosis at an early age, that's typically when we tend to suspect that there's some genetic component to it, uh, something that's really driving it from an early age more than you would expect from the risk factors. So people who have atherosclerosis in their 40s, for example, or their 50s, um, that tends to be what we would call early. As time goes on, what we see with an older age with atherosclerosis is some genetic component, but probably more the accumulation of the effect of those risk factors that we talked about you know, just a moment ago. I also like to say, though, that atherosclerosis is not always inevitable. So you see some people who have a genetic predisposition, it runs in their family. One person adopts a heart-healthy lifestyle, maybe with these medications and chemicals that we talked about, and one person doesn't, maybe chooses to smoke or follow an unhealthy lifestyle, and it's that person that unlocks that genetic potential by following those sort of bad habits or negative lifestyle choices that gets atherosclerosis. This concludes part one of our special two-part episode on cardiac health for February, American Heart Month. To recap, atherosclerosis is not inevitable. Even if it's common among members of a family, there are preventive measures one can take to avoid this disease. These include making physical activity, even light exercise, part of every day, and avoiding over-processed foods, and especially smoking or vaping. Plaque is a very complex substance made of whole host of elements. As Dr. Khan stated, plaque is never normal, but it is more common as people get older. Maintaining overall low cholesterol is a preventive measure against atherosclerosis. Cholesterol has two main components, HDL and LDL. While there is still more to understand about cholesterol, you want to keep your LDL cholesterol levels in particular low. Now, That's Good Chemistry is a collaboration between the students and faculty at Indian Hill High School in partnership with Tara, Toxicology Excellence for Risk Assessment. Our technical supervisor is Indian Hill and Television Network executive producer and technology teacher, Denny Dubs. Our script supervisor and editor is English teacher, Tom Millard. Our graphic designers are students Liz George and Ryan Kennebeck. Our theme music was composed by former student Preston Marks. 
Thanks to the faculty, staff, and administration at Indian Health for their behind the scenes efforts and support. Until next time, I'm your host, Susan Savage.